now we're talking about millennials buying, right? Yep. So now when now when we're helping millennials buy, how do we write them a winning offer in a very competitive marketplace? Absolutely. You know, so, so this also stems from the coaching call that we were on with Bill the, a couple of days ago. Yep. Um, and, and we have six steps to be able to uh, to get you in a position to, for a winning offer. Hey, Lane, let's take people. a step. Let's take a step backwards. Uh, and, and set the tone a little bit and give our, our viewers once again a feel for what is happening out there today. Um, I, for one, can say for Philip and myself that for our buyers in the last, I'm going to say, golly, several years, I'm going to say going over two years, even with our little dip that we had this March, we have not submitted an offer for one of our buyers where we were not in a multiple offer situation. In other hmm. words, we were never the only game in town. We never felt we held all the cards and we could you know, hold the, you know, hold the, hold the, the, the seller into a vice because, you know, we were the, the, the he, they should feel lucky that we are the buyers that are picking their house. We have always been competing with other buyers and therefore, and we're used to winning, but we're so excited after this call, we've even got better tips for that. But Lane, I want to share, you know, your uh, on the street experience as well. Does that echo uh, what Philip and I have been going through? Yeah, so I'd say a few years ago, we were in multiple offer situations where we'd see three to five offers. And a lot of it was because inventory was really low and demand was really high. Well, this year and, and, and so far of what we've seen for this year, inventory is even lower and demand is even higher. So in a lot of cases, we're getting five up towards of 10 offers. We've had as high as 18 offers on listings. And it's even that much more competitive to where we are instead of competing against you know two to four other offers now we're can be we can be competing against up to nine other offers at this point oh, so crazy. it's really important it's really important to take these steps and these strategies that we're about to share with you and apply them because we do have other little tips and tricks on how to get your offer to rise to the cream of the crop and we might add these to the six as far as little bonus tips as well no absolutely and we have to remember it's it's a competition when we're working with one of our buyers, we don't take second best because second best isn't going to get the house. We've got to figure out how can we increase the odds so you as our buyer are going to rise to the top, win the house. And it does, it, and as we're going to show with our tips, it not is not necessarily the highest priced offer. So that's our little secret. It's not the highest priced offer. It's the strategy. It's also figuring out what space is the seller in? What does this particular seller want to see? And some of the sellers are different. Some of them are more price motivated. Some of them are more time motivated. Some of them are lack of hassle factor motivated. So we've got a lot of tips up our sleeve. We're going to talk about the, the big six right now. So should we get into those lane? Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, it's also, by the way, it's up to the agent to find that information, find out that information of what's motivating the seller as a price, as it terms. And like, and uh, when the agent finds out that information, they're able to develop. And it, again, it might not always be the highest, the highest price. It's the complete package. So getting and gathering all of the information up front to be able to put you in a position to win and, and, and put together that package. It's the whole package that you're submitting to the, to the listing agent that's going to get it accepted. Absolutely. I'm going to interrupt for a quick second before we get to the tips. And to Lane's point, it's not just any agent asking. When you're working with a Sack and Stone team, it's time for a little commercial break, if you will. Hmm. We take it upon ourselves to ask. I learned a long time ago from my great-grandmother, if you don't ask, you don't get. So we're going to have that dialogue with the listing agent on behalf of our buyers getting deeper into what the seller's motivation is. So before we ever submit the offer, we really know what's making them tick. What are they looking for? So we can use these six tips and fine tune them to really put ourselves at the best advantage. Okay. Let's start with, let's start with tip number one. You ready? Bet. All right. Minimal contingencies. Absolutely. The seller, especially today, they want to know they've got a done deal. And in California, we have an escrow period and that goes from contract acceptance to close. It's often about 30 days. And during that time, there's myriad contingencies. And as we talk about with aging homes, the inspection contingencies are expanding these days, you know, from sewer inspections to uh, electrical inspections to geological inspections, overall home inspections. They're just fraught with so many things that uh, could unturn an issue with the house that the seller is scared or you know frightened the buyer is going to back out on. That's just one of the contingencies. We have appraisal contingencies, loan contingencies, and all I want to 
I want to preface too that Scott and I did a video and maybe uh, you, I don't know if it's a couple videos ago where we went in depth on the differences of contingencies and what they yeah. mean. So, um, you know, so, to avoid expanding further on it uh, today, I, I definitely encourage you to take a look at that if you want to learn a little bit more about contingencies. But overall, what what a lot of sellers are looking for these days, especially if you're if there's an increase in price and things are going over the asking prices, and, and we're experiencing now with our own with our own listing. So that's why uh, we're mentioning this is a lot of times we're now asking for the buyer to remove and waive the appraisal contingency yep. altogether. So that means that no matter what the home appraises for, you as a buyer are committed to paying that price, whether yep. price, price is lower, higher at value, which whatever you find value and you found value in offering that price. So you're stuck paying that price. Yeah. Exactly. And I don't use the word stuck on that. So on this tip lane, are we talking really, yeah, no, we, we understand contingencies, but we want to talk specifically about the appraisal contingency and being, being willing to waive that so we can, uh, the buyer can be educated and feel comfortable with that before moving forward. Say it again. I just want to just clarify again, we, our, our, our video talking about contingencies is, is great. And I, we, we really encourage you to watch that because it's very, very educational. But are we talking on our tip for today that we're, we're focusing mainly on the appraisal contingency and the importance of removing that? Because that's most often foremost in the seller's minds. No, I don't think we, I mean, we don't have to just talk about the appraisal contingencies whatsoever uh, altogether. I mean, we can briefly go in uh, as far as like what sellers are looking for. Sellers are looking for right now uh, a, waiver, uh, uh, a waiver of the appraisal contingency yeah. they're looking for shortened investigations contingency within seven to ten days so even though you have a slew of home of inspections like like you alluded to whether it's the sewer main roof inspection general home inspection plumbing electrical whatever it is you still have to be able to get that done in seven to ten mm -hmm. days so you better be working with somebody that has these resources that can get them in and get yep. your reports within seven to ten days exactly um, same thing with the loan contingency i know that a lot of the a lot of the big banks are a little backed up right now especially by taking a lot of the refinances on but you want to get that done within two weeks or less at this point absolutely so well, these are the, oh, go ahead lane I was saying when we talk about minimal contingencies, these are the type of things yeah. that we're talking about. And I think it's good to have that an overview. And again, we can dig in deeper with any of you on a one-on-one on -one basis to, to help you gain the comfort level and understanding with all of these things. Because each each one of these contingencies, you know, could be a 15-minute conversation because we have the facts to, to make, uh, give you more comfort, whether it's uh, working with an appraisal contingency. Any, any of these, we have the facts to make you more comfortable. So we don't want to have any of our buyers think you just have to roll over and, and, and surrender to the sellers. We have uh, ways that we can still keep you comfortable, keep you in, in some measure of control, but give the sellers what they want. So I think with that number, the first tip about contingency re, uh, tightening and, or removals is understanding what the sellers want, how we can represent you as buyers, give the sellers what they want, but also keep you in a great spot. Absolutely. Now I want to be mindful that we are approaching the 30 minute time frame here and we have yeah. five more tips. So I don't want to rush through them, but I want to get through them. So uh, number two is strong down and financing. It's a pretty self-explanatory, but if you're in a multiple offer situation and a lot of people are putting 20, 25, 50% down and, and you might be putting, you know, 5% or 10% down, that's okay. I mean, that's okay because you know, you're still qualified. Uh, but it's you're going to have to rely more on the contingencies that we just talked about at that point and being able to stand firm and show them that you're committed to paying that price and that you're going to be doing things um, to compete against a higher down. So but the higher down, the higher uh, down and, and better finance offers are going to rise to the cream of the crop yeah. today. Number three, a higher offer altogether. So one of the things, Scott, that Bill mentioned was if you're if you have a max price of, let's say, 800,000. And that's what you have set, and that's what, what your max is. Start looking maybe 10 to 15 percent below that, knowing that you might have to write an offer five, 10 percent above that. So yeah. instead of when you're doing your research, instead of putting an 800 max, maybe put a you know a, a 775 or something, a max, and, and then know that you have room to go to eight. You know what? I thought that was one of the best takeaways I had of that because oftentimes we've been conditioned over the years to search just a little bit higher uh, than the client's maximum thinking, oh, we're going to be negotiating downwards. But you know what? Bill made me realize in absolute fact, almost without exception, we have not been able to negotiate downward for our buyers for a long, long time. So why not be realistic from the beginning, knowing that there's probably going to be overbids and it's going to go over asking and lowering that price point to begin with so that we're setting ourselves up for success. 
Now, conversely, I know there's not as many available as there were a few years ago, but it might be a good strategy point to look if you're again, we're using 800,000 as a max for your budget, but it might be interesting to look between eight and eight twenty for homes that have been on the market for 30 days or longer, because those might be the homes that are due for a price yeah. reduction, even though there's not as many available. That's just a little bonus tip there of what to look for. Yeah. So for the newer listings, you're going to be looking at, you know, the seven seventy seven seventy five range for the old the listings that have been sitting a little bit longer. You might be looking between eight yeah. and eight twenty to get you to where you need to be around that eight. Yep. And I know we're, we're, we're moving ahead here, but on a tip on that, and one of the strategies that we, the Sack and Stone team, do employ for our buyers is we're always watching those aging listings that are overpriced. And we generally will have a dialogue with the listing agent and say, it looks like you're kind of due for a price reduction or price adjustment. And we'll have a dialogue with them and they'll say, yes, indeed, we've been having that discussion. So we can actually get in, get an offer submitted kind of ahead of them actually doing the adjustment before it goes out to the masses. And we've put several transactions together that way as well. So that's another topic uh, to discuss strategy wise, but just letting you know, we're looking at it from all ends of the spectrum to make sure we don't miss anything. Absolutely. All right. Number four, love letter. And yep. a little bonus tip when you're writing a love letter, letter is find commonalities with the seller. Um, so obviously we love, we love letters. We love using a photo of the buyers, whether, you know, with the family and the dog and the whole nine. And if you see that they're uh, an angels fan or something like that. And maybe you're an angels fan as well. Maybe start talking about your love for the angels or look, bring, bring something in there uh, just to find the commonality with the seller. Those things work. In addition to love letters from the buyers, we also like to put in uh, what we call our agent resumes. And that's really important too, because the agent, the listing agent is going to have to work with the buyer's agent and they don't want to work with anybody who's not, a, not as strong. You know what I mean? So uh, we want to show them that we have over a 98% close rate and that a good escrow is a closed escrow and that when going with us, we're, we're professional. We know how to get the job done and we know how to get the escrow closed. So these two letters are really important as part of the offering package. And on that note, uh, on that note, as we, again, we know Gen Xers, baby boomers are the, the majority of our sellers. These are the people that are a little bit older. They connect a little bit more with the story and they've often been in their house 10, 20, 30 years, created their own story. And it's important to them to almost pass the home along, if you will, to a person that's going to continue the 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 the, the, the book, if you will, a new chapter of the of the story of this house. And believe it or not, it's very important. I can't tell you how many sellers we've been sitting with that well, they'll say, you know what? I really like these people. I'd like these people to have the house if we can get these other terms in line. Well, one one thing is um, if the number one selling population are Gen Xers or older, um, a lot of them have either no mortgage or a small one. So at the end of the day, a $5,000 difference might not mean much to them. It might mean more to them to find the right buyer. So it's these love letters are really important, uh, especially with the selling population that we're seeing today to be able to get your offer accepted. Right on. Um, okay. Number, number five, act fast. Don't drag your feet. So there's a really good um, quote that we learned a couple days ago too, that I wanted to share with you guys. If you sleep on it, you may not be able to sleep in it. <laughs> so, so make sure you did the, you do the fr the homework up front. You know exactly what you want, so that way when you do find everything that checks your boxes, you do not sleep on it. Because we are seeing offer we are seeing listings go under contract within the first three to five days, if not even sooner. Yeah. So by the time you blink, it's going to be off the market. So yeah. you have to know exactly what you want, and the second that it checks off all your boxes, yeah. jump on it so you can sleep in it. Absolutely. And on that note, what we always for years have always recommended for our clients and now even more so is we see the house. We know we're going to be making the offer. Well, our team is behind the scenes preparing the offer. We want you to take the drive by the house in the morning, in the evening, practice coming home. We want you to just turn in the turn the corner, turn in the driveway and say, I love where I live. I can't wait to get inside the house. And if you take a few drive bys, you know, check out the neighborhood, all that stuff, all that's done before we've even submitted the offer. You already know that from the area and the location standpoint, the whole environment, it works for you. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, let's get to the uh, okay. final. Let's do it. Uh, be ready to write three to five offers. Yeah. Uh, so that's about what that's about the average of what it takes to get an offer accepted in this marketplace. Obviously, uh, we at the Second Stone team like to pride ourselves on in being able to uh, get that done in, in less. But the yeah. industry average is the industry average is three to five offers. So um, just be prepared. You know, not only are we acting fast and, and jumping on the ones that check off all your boxes, but there's a chance that it might take several offers that to get one through. 
Yeah, that's just reality. And again, it's a hard pill for us to swallow because we are used to winning the first time around. We want nothing more than to get that first choice house for our clients. But we have to be realistic. I do feel that we beat the odds of the industry averages out there for sure because of the extra due diligence we put in with these with these strategies. And not to use a metaphor, these are just the tips of the iceberg as far as the tips go. There's half a dozen other tips that we can pull from when we kind of have the whole menu of things that we want to put together to help our clients win from uh, uh, lenders calling uh, calling the sellers and just a whole bunch of a whole bunch of other uh, tips up our up our sleeve. But these are the six main ones that we got from our coaching call the other day, and we're super excited. And then another shout out to the Tom Ferry organization for being such great leaders and mentors for us and allowing us to pass this on to our clients. Yeah, it's, it's really great. And and thank you so much for hanging in there with us today. Yeah. I know we went over our, our, our normal 30 minute time slot, but it wasn't over too much. And I hope you found value. And if you did, and you found something valuable that maybe somebody else might enjoy watching, uh, please share. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, please like, comment. Uh, if you have any questions that you want us to address in the next Q&A show, leave it in the comment box as well. We'll make sure to get to it. We love you. We love that you're participating in our Q&A shows because we love doing them. We don't care if zero people or one person's watching we're still going to continue to do them and get the information out there because it's that important and we don't want to you know keep all these cards held to our vest we want to be able to share with everybody absolutely thanks so much for sharing and we're super excited because our viewership's been growing we're getting more and more comments on a weekly basis and so we do feel these add value but we're always open to critiques criticism comments questions we want to do this all for you thanks for watching